Okay, uh, welcome to uh, change room number 10. Um, this is as high tech as we can get. We've got two cameras running. We've got the AV system going. It's all going to happen here. Um, so uh, could we, and we've got Tracy, I have got a human operator. Could you press the next slide, please? Round of applause for Tracy, uh, please, Tracy McGregor. She does a lot of this and she's very, very experienced at it. Okay, um, so tonight's rundown, we're going to go for about half an hour, we think, uh, and then we'll stop, we'll be open for questions, and then you can chat afterwards and network and mingle. And we're going to be live polling tonight. So uh, some of the biases we will actually be checking by polling each and every one of you. So see if you can find polyv.com slash change room and you should get a nice neat little blue screen saying welcome to change rooms presentation. Have you changed any of these in the past year? Your internet provider, your utilities, that's your, that's your water, your electricity, whatever, insurance provider or none of the above. Have you changed any of these in the past year? The results are coming in as we speak. It's like election night. <laughs> Welcome to the first bias, which is status quo. Sarah? So the status quo bias is not an overappreciation of an 80s rock group. This is about, uh, we like things to stay the same. We like to stick with the current situation. Uh, we like to stick with the decisions that we've already made. Um, despite the fact that actually studies have found that if you swap providers, you can save a huge amount of money. So for instance, organ donation in countries where it's automatic, they have an over 95% organ donation rate. In Australia, not so much because we have to actually opt in to the whole process. More like, more like 16 and in the UK there were six people a day dying from for want of uh, organs and so they've actually just changed it they flipped it last February from being um, uh, opt-in to opt-out. Biases are mental shortcuts to make quick but not always rational decisions. So these are, um, we call them heuristics or mental shortcuts, they're something that have evolved. They allow us to make very quick, efficient decisions, maybe sometimes with minimal information, and using very little cognitive effort. Um, so they can be very helpful, but they can also mean that we um, reduce our opportunities or do not access information that we need. And it also leads us against the traditional uh, sort of economic model of wholly rational decision making based on perfect information. So we end up making decisions um, with just having little bits and pieces and our um, quick thinking brains take over and make the decision for us. So the economist said that uh, humans are basically homo economicus, the rational person. Um, we would suggest it's more like Homer Simpson, um, irrational. <laughs> not really driven by high thoughts, but driven by a lot of very quick decisions. Um, the other thing is, come on in, um, we have to make shortcuts for decisions because... Well, we're making so many decisions every day. If we agonised over every single decision, we'd quickly starve or get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Most of the time, they can help us make quick decisions. We're required to make a lot of them every day, and they do help. Um, we'd like to point out some of the irrationalities that happen when we go with these biases. So can we have the next slide, please? I think it's the Wheel of Bias. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for the Wheel of Bias. <laughs> with the dancing cursor. Okay, um, so the wheel of bias is basically a very, very simplified version of the codex of biases. There's over 200 of them. We're gonna do all 200, to, no we're not. <laughs> we've got 20, so basically what we've done is we've divided it up into a sample bias from every single one of the codex um, chapters and it comes down to four basic problems. Number one, too much information. What's happening there? Uh, we generate vast amounts of data every day. The number of tweets that are released in a second is astronomical. We can't possibly deal with all the information that's out there. We just have to use what we can access. Not enough meaning. Uh, so rather than being able to generate meaning from everything, we make our own meaning based on our previous experiences and our assumptions. We have to act and act fast. We need to make decisions quickly. As Jeff said, this is something that's stood us in good evolutionary stead. Is that a rock? Is it a tiger? It's probably a tiger I'm going to run. Um, if it was a rock, it doesn't matter. That's OK. You've saved. You've lived to fight another day. And the stuff, I have to remember stuff. 
So, um, and how we remember things also affects our decisions. So the way that we store and retrieve memories um, also affects our decisions when we make them. Um, so you will recognise most of the biases we talk about. Uh, you may be surprised to know that there are scientific names for these behaviours. We've come across all of these behaviours in the past. They have actually been studied. They've been given names. Some of the names are after the researchers that identified them. Some are obvious names and some are frankly academic kooky names that don't make any sense at all. Um, but Tracy, could you hit the spin button and see if this thing works? Okay, yeah. Okay, and stop. This is where we assess um, past events on our, our... We think that we could have predicted events that have happened. So the real world example is most people think that the GFC was coming. Economists didn't predict it, but afterwards they said, ah, of course, that was going to happen. The fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Barack Obama's election. Can we have a slightly more relevant example? We have so a really very scientific example. So The Bachelor. <laughs> right, so it was like, how obvious was it that the honey badger was not going to pick anyone? Like, to, could totally see that coming. <laughs> shaking his head. <laughs> you were like, I thought the honey badger was going to pick Melissa. <laughs> it's that kind of scientific rigour we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. That's exactly right. All right. Uh, if you hit the little magic button and stop. Uh, yes, that is sunk cost bias. Okay, what is that? So the sunk cost bias, this is when we assess things, projects, um, relationships, uh, films, uh, massive infrastructure decisions based on what we've invested already, time, money, emotions, um, rather than is it achieving what we want it to achieve. Who has rented a movie that they hate and still watched the whole movie because they paid for it? Who has been in a relationship a little bit longer than they thought? <laughs> okay. So, uh, sunk cost bias, and because the irrationality of this is not that you, it, it is the idea that it's what you put into it, not the outcome. So it's not the future, you're looking back to the past. Um, the Opera House, we hold the world record for the most um, over budget project yes. ever. Yes. Something to, I think to be proud of. 1400%. 100% over budget. <laughs> Uh, because the guy that built it basically spat the dummy and left and we had the shell design and no one knew how to put the whole thing together. Well, they started building it without actually knowing how they were going to yeah. finish it. It's like the biggest IKEA project anywhere in the world. <laughs> With no instructions. Uh, we have a great example here. This is a real world example. This is the Joint Strike Fighter. This uh, airplane was designed to be the Swiss Army pocket knife of fighter jets. Um, they cost $143 million each um, and they, they're not actually ready. They've been in production for about 20 years. Um, <laughs> And it doesn't matter what they do with this thing, we keep throwing money at it. So some of the problems are, um, if you press eject, the helmet's so heavy, it could break your neck. It's a weird disincentive right there. Um, <laughs> it gets so hot that they have to open the weapons bay, which means that the stealth thing doesn't really work because it makes an awful lot of noise when it goes through the air with the weapons bay open to keep the engine cool. Um, all the software was hacked. hacked. A um, <laughs> couple of million lines of software was hacked, so they had to wipe it out and start the whole thing again. And nine different countries are chipping the money in, Australia's one of them, and it doesn't matter how long the bill gets, we just keep pouring money into this thing. Um, but the good news is that... Yay, taxpayers! <laughs> When it is ready, they think it'll be obsolete because there'll be drones out there doing everything anyway. So, that's our taxes at work. All right, uh, let's go back to the wheel and see what else we've got. People have had a terrible time on holiday, obviously. <laughs> that's what it tells me. They've had a really weird time. I would say safely that most people think falling coconuts Falling coconut seems to be the winner. But the problem is that this is to do with the availability bias. The problem is that we don't actually hear an awful lot about um, lightning strikes in the newspaper. It's not very sexy, you know, people are out having a nice time and they get hit with a bolt from the blue, quite literally. Um, sharks um, always get reported on because there's nothing like fear beneath the waves to drive your emotions. But availability bias is when we predict the likelihood of an event happening based on the things that we most um, easily recall, the things that are front of mind. So especially if we've seen them in the media recently. And Spielberg never made a horror movie about a coconut. About co but maybe he should. <laughs>
and stop. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yeah. The Dunning Kruger effect. This is Mr. Dunning and Kruger together. No, it's not. Okay. No, they're probably Dr. Dunning and Kruger, to be honest, Jeff. Um, this is the Dunning Kruger effect. This is a really interesting effect. They did a series of studies on students and they were looking at things like their um, abilities with grammar, their abilities with logic. And what they found was that the less competent um, the um, participants were, the higher they rated their competence. So this is when you don't know how dumb you are because you're too dumb to know how much you don't know. We are not making a connection with anyone in the room, okay? So, yeah. so you end up with this really interesting graph by which people who know nothing know that they know nothing, okay? So they're no, under no um, disillusions, illusions. Um, but then people who know just a little tiny bit think they know loads. And then people know who know a bit more know that they um, don't know very much. So it goes down until you get to the geniuses who know that they know loads. Um, and so it's these people here that we end up voting into power. <laughs> system justification. So this is when, um, this is when we don't want to uh, mess with things, we don't want to infer, interfere with the status quo um, in case it might mess things up completely. For instance, um, I don't send my kids to church because the idea that there was some godlike being watching them and gauging what they do is frankly ridiculous. So you've, you've told them about Father Christmas? No, 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 I don't want them to miss out on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So we're assessing things by what the current situation is and we're, we're really not willing to interfere. And th this is really interesting in, uh, in these times because we know that there is growing inequality, um, there's um, increasing, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Um, in some areas in the US there's 43 million people living in poverty, whilst the wealthy 1%, 0.5% are getting steadily um, wealthier, and yet we do nothing. <laughs> so. it, it's also the, it, it's the bias that says, I don't support the war, but I have to support our troops. In group bias. In group bias. Yeah. So this is where we value uh, the members, the characteristics, the products of those who we perceive as being like us in some way. So they have some sort of um, similar values or beliefs or background or understanding. And so we value those people more. Sarah, if you saw a Collingwood supporter on a push bike, why would you not run them over? Uh, could be your bike. It could be your bike. That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> Are there any Collingwood supporters in the room? I don't stand by that last joke. Um, I don't know why it's even there. Okay. Um, has anyone heard of Jane Elliott and the Blue Eye Brown Eye Experiments uh, from the States? Okay, this is um, 50 years old last year. The day after Martin Luther King had been assassinated, she did an experiment with her totally white uh, third grade students in Iowa and she basically said who would like to know what it's like to feel um, uh, the bias, particularly racial bias, they put their hands up and they said okay everyone with the brown eyes in the room is better than the blue eyed kids, you are simply better, you're smarter, you're better. The brown eyed students got access to the drinking fountains, the blue eyed kids had to use a cup, they could not drink from the same water. They got longer playtime. They got longer playtime, they got a longer recess, they were highly praised. The blue-eyed students were told that they had to work much, much harder and almost instantly the results were shown. The brown-eyed students were more confident, uh, they were more condescending, fights broke out. Um, uh, and, they, and they all, and it was almost immediate. So this was something that happened within the day that she set the, um, the experiment. And then the next day she reversed it. Um, so that it was the other way around and there was still the reactions but it was slightly muted because obviously they'd already <laughs> felt it the other way around. Yeah. Um, I don't think you get ethics for that experiment these days. <laughs> Good. Right, so there, uh, no, we've done it. We've done it. We imagine what others are thinking. We fill in gaps of stereotypes. Oh, if, if, did, yeah. Have we done that? No, uh, I just like the we imagine what others are thinking one. <laughs> Well, do we want to do that? We imagine what others are thinking. That's the wheel spoke, Jeff, to be honest. Curse of knowledge. All right, okay. What is, um, 
What is the curse of knowledge? Curse of knowledge. So this is something that we all have to be aware of, I reckon, in our in our spheres and the people that we're working with, and if we're working with um, uh, different people when we're communicating, is that you know, are we, do, are we assuming that people know what we're talking about? Does anyone know what that sign is warning you against? Lightsabers. Lightsabers. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's a no vaping sign. Uh, oh. I had, I had, ah, ah. Um, people have said, is it a no cattle prod sign? Is it no lightsaber? What does it mean? Um, but we, this sort of stuff happens all the time. For instance, Sarah, FYI, our BAM has gone MIA over the POA, CRM turning up DOA. What? <laughs> Greg couldn't get the new software to work. We use the curse of knowledge all the time and uh, a great example would be the nightly news. Uh, we might hear something that says commodities have surged with the FTSE and Dow indices factoring a three point rate rise across the sector. Most of us go, mm-hmm, <laughs> with no clue what they're talking about. Um, and yet we, millions of people around the world go, mm-hmm, good, good to know. Right. And the people who do need to know that information probably don't get it off the evening news. All right. Okay. Some memories are stored differently. Ah, That's the yeah. Google effect. Google effect. So basically. So this might be one that may be familiar to some people. This is the idea that we use the internet these days as really an external memory that is part of us, but not part of us. So we actually forget information quicker when we know that we can Google it, um, which is incredibly lazy. So we've, we've stopped being able to remember stuff because we know it's on Google, because <laughs> we know it's on Google. We use the internet as our extended brain. And we also, it also means that in studies, people have assessed themselves as knowing a lot more just because they have their phone on the table in front of them. Yes, this is a very real effect that people uh, believe they don't have to store the knowledge, they can find out where they can get the knowledge, basically. So they know where they can get it from, this is a good answer. Um, and a variation on that is people who sit at the meeting and take a snapshot of the whiteboard and go, great, I've got it. <laughs> good meeting. If a coin toss is heads, 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 what is the likely turn up next going to be? All right, um, so yeah, most of you got it right. It's equal heads or tails, uh, but some people think it's tails. So the gambler's fallacy is when we assess a series of events um, and imagine that they're related when in fact they're completely independent of each other. So when we toss a coin, what comes up is completely independent. There's no, it has no um, impact on what comes next. Um, and so for gamblers, um, you know, when people pick numbers from the lottery that have been the ones that have come up most often previously in the lottery, like there's, no, there's no reason. The balls have no effect on each other. They're completely it's, independent. It's also why uh, people at pokies venues will angrily fight over a machine they've been feeding coins into because they go, it's my turn. This is my machine. It's got to be my turn right it's now. My turn. And a real life example would be people who keep having babies in the hope that they will get the little boy or little girl that they want. Hands up who knows a family that kept having kids. Much larger than it would have been. Yeah. <laughs> Although in my case, uh, that wasn't the case at all. Yeah. I'm the last of six. And the last of six. My, um. my brother was the accident. I was company for the accident. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's affected my self-esteem to this day. <laughs> Prejudice. So this is normally um, negative um, attitudes or actions towards um, uh, people or persons in another group uh, because of their, oh, you name it, because of their height, gender, religion, cultural background, uh, anything, football team. Mm. Um, you name it. So it's when we can get, and we have a couple of experts on prejudice in the audience. Welcome, welcome. Um, and um, how, how does prejudice break down? It's personal contact. They would say when we know someone from that group that we would otherwise have quickly made judgments about, when we marry them, know them, or they're part of our social group, that prejudice tends to break down because we can't be general. We have to be specific. We know someone. Um, and even in the language that is used, are they asylum seekers or illegals? It tells you the prejudice that comes with that.
Mm. And, and language has been used a lot uh, in, well, I would say, just in history, but it's not. I mean, let's be realistic. You know, how we use uh, terminology and phraseology to describe a group of people, as you say, indicates um, a prejudici prejudicial attitudes. Um, bizarre, funny, things stand out. Um, so yeah, so things that, things that stand out, things that um, we recall them more easily, so we remember them more easily when they stand out. Um, Hedwig von Restorff, mm -hmm. 1933. Um, upsettingly, this was her dissertation, and she ended up with like a bias named after her. I mean, it's something to aim for. <laughs> um, uh, so this was, yeah, this was her dissertation. So she was using lists of words and she was trying to find out which ones were more memorable and the ones that, st that stood out that had some sort of salience. Um, and she also used colour as well to make things stand out. And this is the effect behind things like uh, the notifications on your phone when you get uh, emails and you say you've got 15 emails. Let's be realistic. When you have 75 emails um, and it comes up with a little red box, that is due to the von Restorff effect. You notice it because it's, um, it comes up, it's more salient. The authority bias, so this is when we look to others um, and we take people that we perceive to have or a position of authority and we look to them to help influence our decision making. Um, so this is something that's sort of bred within us, within the culture that we have and the society that we live within, you know, we have figures of authority that we have to listen to, you know, police and medical personnel and parents and so on and so forth. Um, but in this day of social media, it means that people can become perceived to be authority figures with questionable credentials. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't uh, know who this is, this is uh, Chanel and Bryce Cartwright. Uh, and offspring, I don't know the baby's name, uh, but Chanel is now an authority on the anti-vaccination movement because she's decided that she is not going to vaccinate. And she's put that onto social media. Everything, uh, print, television, social media, that's basically, she's become an authority and in fact um, a friend of her is now doing a tour on... Um, Another NRL wife, yes. NFL, NRL. NRL, it's the NRL. NRL. Um, so, uh, in the same way that Pete Evans has become an authority on, um, I think it's the paleo baby diet, diet and the baby broth that was uh, turned out to be uh, lethal. Lethal. Yeah. Too high vitamin A levels, you cannot give your baby bone broth instead of breast milk. It will kill them. Yes. Which is why women do not produce bone broth. <laughs> <laughs> you had thought he would have realised that, but anyway. Um, so this, this idea that because they're a, they're a um, uh, public figure um, and well known, I mean she seems very nice, she's 20, she's a mother of two, um, and so she appeals to a, a wide audience but it means that her words carry authority because she's well known rather than because she knows anything. Peak end rule, how does that work? Okay, so the peak end rule, um, this is when one would expect that we assess and judge events or times or activities by an average of how it was. So did you have a nice holiday? How was it on average? Um, but we don't. We, instead, we use these snapshots. Um, there's two snapshots that we use in particular. The peak, the most intense, so whether that was positive or negative, and then the end. Did it finish well, which is, I mean, good call for us, Jeff. I mean, it's a good thing we've got wine outside. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so we actually assess it by the average of those two events, the peak and the end. Um, so this was used in an interesting study. Colonoscopies. Um, <laughs> let's get to the bottom of this straight. <laughs> they, okay, come on. Um, so they basically uh, were getting uh, people who had undergone colonoscopy operations to rate the experience. Some had a two-day procedure, some had a week-long procedure, and they found that the results were about the same. In other words, people were basically measuring the experience by the most intense part and the end. Um, two snapshots of a memory. It's a way that we package memories. So this is, um, you know, because the purest form of data is anecdote. Um, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. I don't, I don't mean that, boss. Um, <laughs> So this was at uh, 
this was at my daughter's vaccination, um, <laughs> just to counteract any social norms that we might have given you with the last one, um, uh, the other week. And so she went in, there was a magician, there was a juggler, they had stencils, they had stickers, they had lollies, they had a party bag, they had a balloon string, you can just see there. And they also had some very nice nurses who were jabbing all the small children in the arm. So when she was repeat, um, re recalling her day to her grandparents that evening, nanny and granddad, I went to a party this afternoon. I was prompting her, you know, what happened then? I had a lolly. What happened then? It was orange flavor. What happened then? There was a magician. What happened then? And at no point did she go, oh yes, and I got shot in the arm by this <laughs> person with a massive needle. She'd completely forgotten. <laughs> Um, uh, to contrast, my son at the age of 10, we had to give him uh, vaccination for going overseas. He ran round the GP's office screaming and hid under the desk. <laughs> Took about six more years before he came anywhere near a needle. So congratulations, I've crushed him for life. <laughs>this is about false memory. Um, you didn't break your arm, it's a lie. No, uh, okay. <laughs> Sarah, how does false memories work? False memory. So this was some work that came out of the state. So this is uh, Elizabeth Loftus, who's a very well-known um, psychologist who work, does a lot of work around memory. And upsettingly, it was her grad student um, who came up with this. I know I'm taking this very personally. Um, he, who came up with this uh, test for um, imprinting or implanting false memories, and he as all good researchers do, tried it out on his family first. Um, and he had them um, create so, a diary. Yeah, a diary. So siblings would uh, write a diary of one of their siblings. So if it was Sarah, uh, Sarah's brothers and sisters would write a diary that said, Sarah was a sweet little girl who loved ponies and uh, went to the fair and uh, loved colouring in. And then they would plant a false memory. There was that time where Sarah got lost in the shopping centre. It was an awful time. Finally, she was found and she was fine. And then they would give the diaries to Sarah or the participants to see if they agreed with the uh, results. 25% of people agreed with the memory of being lost in the shopping centre when that didn't happen. It was completely false. It was completely made up. Mm. And, then they, and they had real trouble, first of all, identifying the one that was false. And then when they were presented with the one that was completely made up, they were like, no, that definitely happened. Yeah. So, do false memories work on a cultural level? Possibly. Um, Australia seems to think that um, the Gallipoli was a landing, not an invasion. That's how we remember it. The fact that we had guns and were firing at the time doesn't make it an invasion. Uh, we also have this cultural memory that um, Australia was in. The founding of Australia. The top three things to take away about uh, biases, we all have them. What we need to know is that we all, we all have biases, as we mentioned. Did we talk about biases? We, we did talk about biases. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we all have biases. If you don't think you have biases, you're suffering from bias blindness. Um, That's the thing. There is a bias bias. There's a bias bias. So if you don't think you suffer from bias, you're, it's, it's bias bias. There had to be one. It's over 200. There's bound to be one. Um, so we all have them and they can affect our decision making. As, as we said, they can be very helpful. They help us make decisions very quickly. They help us make decisions when sometimes we have limited information. But sometimes they lead us to make decisions um, that are not uh, maybe wholly in our best interest or the best interest of those people around us. And so by being aware of some of the most commonly occurring ones, it can help us shape our decision making um, and uh, focus, focus a little bit on what an alternative direction might be. And good design can counteract or exploit them. So sometimes you want to take the biases into account. You can exploit the bias if you know it's going to be there or you can counteract that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for tonight. Um, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>